Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode nine of Daily Tips, Noodles, and Shredding. This one is going to be more like a talk than a guitar lesson, so I um, hope you're prepared for that. Um, before that, we're about to go on the road Midwestern tour, tour this weekend, so if you guys are in Iowa, uh, Minnesota, Nebraska, Missouri, I th- are we going to Missouri? Kansas City, th- that whole area, so go to bensontown.com slash Marvin and check it out. Um, What I want to talk to you about is uh, something that a lot of people that I teach and talk to, I feel are a little bit confused about, and that's jazz improvisation in general, you know, kind of what we're doing when we're improvising. And uh, I'd like to tell you a story. I went to Berkeley College of Music, and I think, um, you know, music schools are overrated. Uh, A lot of people really think that you get something there that you can't get anywhere else. Um, And, you know, in a way I can see why when you send somebody from the ages of like, you know, 18 to 22 somewhere, you make huge leaps in that time if you work on it. So uh, I can see like coming out, how, how it would appear that somebody that, you know, went to somewhere like that and practiced and really kept kind of an open mind about things and then comes out the other end of the loop much better, it would seem like, you know, um, the school did that, did all that good. Uh, But mostly it's the individual, I think. But uh, I had really a great experience in the sense that I had a really great teacher. His name was David Tronzo. He was a slide guitar player, avant-garde, and we never, ever played guitar, and he never showed me anything on guitar, but we just talk. And I think that by the time he was done talking to me, I graduated. And like we never actually had a guitar lesson. I just go there and he talk, and he ripped me to shreds. Just and for me, the type of person I am, I needed it at the time, you know, because I think, um, you know, I had to really kind of learn how to get destroyed and build myself up from scratch. But I'll never forget one of the first lessons I've ever had. I ever had with him, um, you know. He asked me, like, you know, well, what's improvisation? And, you know, I was talking about scales and chords. And he told me something that just resonated with me so deeply and really changed the way I look, you know, not just at music, but at life. He's like, when you go home from my office to the dorm, travel a new path home, you know. And I was like, wow. Because for me, I was the kind of person, you know, I had the best way of getting to the building, you know, up till that point. Really, I did, you know, if I went to the bathroom, I'd get, you know, in, in a public space, I'd find my urinal and then I'd go there every time if I had to go again, you know, if I was in the same room, I'd kind of make these random choices and then assume that because they were a safe choice, I'd repeat them. But, you know, jazz improvisation, in a way, it's like, you know where you're going, you know what I mean? It's like you're going from point A to point B, you're going from the start of the song to the end of the song. You're going from the guitar studio to your dorm. You're going from the grocery store home. But that part that makes the small decisions of how to get places, if you're the type of person that doesn't have that part of themselves freed up, then you're really going to be an unexciting, unspontaneous player. And it comes from like just making small decisions based on impulse. And, you know, and I'm, and that was, it was a deep lesson. It was really a deep lesson. It really made me start living my life differently. And eventually, it makes your playing become a little different. So that was, you know, kind of a deep thing that happened that I think really, really is profound. What happened to me with Tronzo was interesting because I was, I loved his playing. I thought he was the shit. And um, in my time there, I would listen to his recordings. He's not a famous player. And he has a very unique approach to guitar. Check him out. You know, it's very strange. It's like kind of Ornette Coleman on guitar playing weird free shit and has definitely his own sound. And I studied him. I really, I studied him the way you really dig into a person. And I remember my last year there, 
I showed him. I never would show him like the, the stuff I was working on, but I kind of, you know, I was playing guitar for him and I was kind of imitating him for him. I was show and for me it was like, you know, I really expected this like him to be impressed, you know, because I really did a good job. I'm pretty, you know, it took me, I think, a year or two and I played all this weird slide shit and I was like just playing the types of phrases he would play and getting a similar sound to what he got. And he looked at me and he was like, man, you're fucked up. And I was like, oh, you know, what happened? And he, and he told me, it's like, imagine that, uh, I'm, that we're going on a trip, right? And I'm your... And I'm your guide through the trip. And we're walking together. And that's like as a metaphor for teaching me. And, you know, I'm telling you, look at that hill. Look at that mountain. And then I look back. And when I see you, you're just mimicking my moves. Like, look at that mountain. Look at that hill. Instead of seeing what I'm showing you. Saying that, like, he was trying to show me a world of music. And I was imitating his motions. Instead of actually learning what's there, exploring the sounds, exploring the ideas on my own, because I wasn't confident enough in my body, in my shell, I was trying to live life through what, you know, through the gestures he was showing me, I was imitating, and, you know, that's kind of the world of classical music, of learning pieces and jazz, splits there, and time and time again, you see the people that make the same mistakes. Now, then the musical institutions are partially to blame for this. Why? Because of the, the repertoire mentality, I think. That's, that's the biggest thing. I think that there's an overemphasis um, on transcription. My partner in Marvin, Danny, wrote actually a thing about transcribing, like uh, an article CD Baby posted at some Israeli forums, about how transcribing is bad. And it was a very misunderstood article in a way because everybody transcribes. I transcribe, he transcribes, everybody ever transcribe. But there are two ways when you go about learning from the masters that you can do it. And one of them is the, like learning pieces like like a musical piece, like uh, as if it's classical repertoire, and that's really not the way I would I would ever do it. And then there's like taking what they're doing and really like when whenever a sound you is unfamiliar or you know you you hear Charlie Parker play a lick and you don't know what it is, then you find out what chord it works with, when he used it, what came before and after. And kind of try to take like these little chunks and make them fit inside your musical world. Expand, like through taking pieces of other people's ideas, expand your own musical identity. Rather than study them like they're a thing. Like a lot of people, I think, waste a lot of time studying box music as a jazz, you know, wanting to be jazz improvisers. And I get it, you know, it's like you learn a piece of music. It's good to spend time with your instrument. If it's technically challenging, you might learn some moves. But... At the end, to me, whenever I did that, I was always confronted with like, okay, now what? Like, I'm, I'm not a classical musician. I don't have a recital coming up. Who am I doing this for? What's the purpose of this? You know? And when you spend times with like your own playing and the way you improvise and then maybe try to add a little chunk of something to that, flip it around, examine it, I feel like you get into some better kind of results. The other thing is that Charlie Parker and Django Reinhardt, you know, if those are the people, like if you like the very best people, Coltrane, Django, the one thing that, you know, you can say for sure about their growth is that they never, like Charlie Parker never transcribed Charlie Parker. That's not the way to get there, right? I mean, he played like that, but if you want to play like that, you don't need to transcribe it. There's a different way. Maybe you need to check out what he checked out. Maybe you need to learn how to think like he thought or in a similar way, you know, not exactly like he thought, but it's not really by imitation. I think it's more by like kind of getting to know your, your own playing, adding things to that. Also think about the way these people and these people when they transcribed, you know, they had like the technology they had, like record players, maybe like even gramophones, like some of them, it's like, you know, radio, it would like come by, you know, they try to pick up half a lick. So think about that. You take a, ch they would take a chunk of music from the air, 
get a general gist of what it was and then sit with like an idea and try to figure things out. Now we have all this technology that I think is might be a little damaging, like slowing things down, learning it piece for piece so accurately. To me, it's more about like taking a little musical musical chunk and spending a lot of time thinking, you know? It's like it's ear training to me. It's like a stupid idea because, you know, the ears are just physical things. It's brain training, you know? It's like everything together. You you maybe transcribe a little piece, but then you think, where does it fit? What chord? What scale does it come from? What song do I play where it can do something cool? The danger, the real danger about uh, about imitating is this. Think of, I like the metaphor of the cake. You know, think about somebody's playing as a cake and... A cake is wrapped with a thin layer of frosting. And that's like all the flash in someone's playing, right? It's very clear when you think about a guy like Louis Armstrong with the... And like the big vibrato and all that. Or Sidney Bechet with like, you know, the really extreme, really extreme articulation. And uh, people like that. It's very easy to just see the frosting and try to take that. You know what I mean? But the cake itself is what makes it good. Their sense of rhythm, their sense of harmony, their the power of their personality, how they feel the music, you know, it's like all the things that those beautiful articulations that are just, you know, kind of the flash, the pizzazz that's wrapping it is sitting on. And I think now more than ever, it's uh, we have a generation of people that's collecting frosting. You know, and really not examining cake. Everybody assume, oh yeah, I, I can play music. My time is great. You know, my, I can play a melody fine, but like if only I learned that vibrato. I, you know, I, ha- I, I, I know like my scale knowledge is fine. I just need to know that lick. Well, you know, it's like you're not working on the core. You're just kind of collecting this thing. And then, you know, when, when you play for people, maybe, they, maybe it's too sweet. You know, it's like, it's like, like you know, just... Not a lot of substantial things, and they're just like a lot of this superficial um, things you took from people's playing. And when you think about what it means, like, you know, you think about like a guy who's a, a deep kind of uh, a deep person that's speaking, right? Now, if you imitate the way he sounds, then it might be funny, but you're doing just an imitation of his voice. But you're not taking the deep things about what he's saying and how he's building his ideas and how he's thinking, right? And to me, that's really transcribing. Transcribing is understanding what people are actually doing and understanding their choices, understanding why. And transcribing really has nothing to do with repeating their notes and rhythms, Um, you know, to, to a deep level. You know, I mean, I guess I wouldn't call it transcribing. Transcribing is the notes and rhythms, but learning from people. You know, you learn from Charlie Parker by listening to Charlie Parker and understanding kind of the big picture, the effect that, uh, that his playing has on you and allowing that to kind of seep in. So, you know, it's not just listening to music it's kind of listening to music and arriving at the right conclusions about what are the things about someone's playing that make it make it work um all right i want to talk to you about one more thing uh and that's schools and mostly the scenes in the schools and the scenes in the cities and just being not ashamed to not be a part of them and to be at home uh when i was at school I was not a part of the jazz scene whatsoever. I didn't play with people till very late in the game. Um, and, you know, for better or worse, some people did it and, you know, had a great time doing it. Um, but for me, I always hated sounding like shit. And I would really listen to myself. And, and you know, there were other people around me, you know, the other students, and I could see something that they were doing wrong the whole time. And that caused them to not like me. I, mean, I was not, you know, especially like the jazz people. I always had friction with jazz people my whole life. And I know Danny Markovich and Marvin too. Because we shared this. We were like, yeah, you might be playing this song better. But we all sound like shit. And they don't do that. You see, when you're in a scene, when you're in a school, people compare themselves to each other. 
you know there's like the the kid who sounds great and does a coltrane impersonation and plays saxophone real hard gets red runs out of air sweats and thinks he's in the zone um and or you know when you're in new york same thing same thing to me all that shit it doesn't matter you know it's like compare yourselves to the great set your set set your goals high and don't be ashamed to spend time at home alone getting better figuring things out your own pace your own rhythm um it's so important and i think that you know so little people so many people feel like this crippling kind of sense of shame now you know at the same token I don't consider myself a very talented dude. I think maybe with a talent of a person much more technically talented than me spending the same amount of time maybe would have been farther along, but I also know that there's very few people on this planet that are willing to invest that much time in one thing, you know. And again, you go to the swimming pool, you know, you you can go there to just have fun. Not everybody has to want to be Michael Phelps. But if you do want to swim fast, it's probably good to check out what Michael Phelps is doing, not what your buddy who swims faster than you does. You know what I mean? So that's, that's my mentality on, on that whole thing. Be very careful of scenes. Be very careful of getting sucked into like the local hierarchy. All that shit doesn't exist, you know? It, it's very funny, but like, you know, when we came to the States, Danny Markovich, saxophone player, was... Um, you know, the first thing we did is we took all, we, we called Paul Wertico, the ex-drummer from the Pat Metheny group, which we loved. I grew, we both grew up on his drumming. We, we, when we moved to Chicago, we knew we had to get in touch with him. We called him and we set up a lesson. He didn't even know that we're not drummers. We came to his house with all of our gear and we played for him. And he took us to join his band like that day, you know, as soon as we, you know, right, right when we got to, to town. And Danny had to go to school for like six months just to get his uh, his visa so he could be in the U.S. He quit right after he got his artist visa. But he took the job of, you know, that like saxophone professor in Paul's band and uh, immediately because we didn't buy into the hierarchy. You know, if you're if you if you're good enough and you have your own thing and you know who you want to play with. And you know that your sound is going to work with them. Just approach them human to human. Skip that whole thing. Skip that whole game. You know, don't go to the jam sessions. Don't don't do that. Don't play that jazz game. It it doesn't exist anymore. You know, it used to be like back in the, you know, when Charlie Parker and Monk were like hanging out in the jam session. Then, yeah, you'd go to the jam session. They might take you to their band. Now it's just fucking bunch of students playing on each other. It's nothing. You know, it's it sucks. Uh, and, and people, nobody plays well and every and nobody knows how to behave. And it's like the, the whole vibe is so nasty, um, you know, and there's there's no bands anymore. You know what you need to do now if you want to make music is sit at home, figure who you are, figure out who you are, start sounding good, book gigs, get a band together and be a band, you know, like make music that's together, that sounds good, that people want to hear. I think that's the number one thing, even in jazz and fusion, that's missing, you know, just bands, you know, and people really making the commitment to stick stick it out together and really making a collective sound that has, you know, character. So, um, yeah, I hope this helps, and I uh, hope to see you guys on tour. Laters.